uh, Sara originally from Alaska and she um, uh, um, well connected to Alaska, except maybe not politically. And uh, she went for her undergraduate degree to mainland. Uh, she did undergraduate in Stanford. And I think with her mentor, uh, Miller, uh, she went to Far East of Russia to do field work. Uh, after it, she uh, went for a PhD to University of Michigan, where she worked on very different topic on uh, sort of on dust uh, preserved in Antarctic ice and potential and using strontium and uh, samarium neodymium to trace the sources of dust and implication for a fertilization of the ocean. Uh, for postdoc, she did a, a one-year postdoc at University of California Irvine, working on uh, more recent stuff. And after it, she moved with uh, a postdoc from private foundation to University of Chicago, uh, where she uh, started to work on a different technique, uh, so a switching from teams to ICP multi-collect ICPMS, and uh, particularly working on titanium isotopes. And um, uh, recently she joined uh, Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography. Uh, so it's a great addition to UC system. And she's building a lab and um, so will have a multi-collect ICPMS lab in Scripps, which is great for us. It will be close to us. And um, she, uh, uh, has this unusual combination of using both techniques, uh, teams and multi-collect ICPMS for her work, and uh, also uh, working on topics ranging from uh, modern um, sort of dust sources to uh, to top topic that she will talk today using titanium isotopes to understand when the plate of Tony started to now point. And with this, I pass it to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Andre, for the really nice introduction. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Is that showing up okay for everyone? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for coming here today. Um, I know it's uh, the week after daylight savings, so I think maybe I'm feeling it a little bit. Um, and I'm sure everyone else is, uh, unless you're on the East Coast, but even so. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, a project that I did during my postdoc, um, and it's really about using uh, stable titanium isotopes to give us some information about the magmatic conditions that um, rocks from the Acasta Nice complex um, from Canada uh, may have formed in during the Hadean and Archean boundary. Um, and before I jump in, I just wanted to um, acknowledge all of the funding that really made this work possible. So like Andre mentioned, I received um, a few postdoctoral fellowships, including the Ford Foundation Postdoc Fellowship and a UC uh, fellowship. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge everyone who, um, you know, did actually did the field work to collect these samples. Um, Jesse Raymink was a, a really great collaborator. He provided us with these samples um, and helped a lot with the interpretation um, and eventual write up of the paper. Um, Nick Greber, Andy Hurd, uh, Jua, and Nicola were also um, co authors on this, on this manuscript. Um, and then I also wanted to um, acknowledge all of the members of the Origins Lab at the University of Chicago who really helped a lot with mass spec, mass spectrometry wrangling, um, provided a lot of insight, advice, and modeling help um, that aided in the interpretation of the, of the study. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start pretty broad and I'm showing this, this figure or this slide um, to ask the question of, you know, when did Earth go from, um, hang on, when did Earth go from this, you know, hellish environment um, characterized, you know, it, this is what we think of when we think about the Hadean, um, to one of modern Earth? So the question of how and when Earth went from this terrestrial magma ocean um, to the one that we know of and are familiar with today uh, is still kind of relatively unanswered. 
Um, you know, so the Hadean period, which marked the end of the formation and the differentiation events um, caused by the moon forming impact, um, the core formation and um, the magma ocean kind of occurred by four and a half billion years ago. Um, but the timing of when we transitioned from an environment um, with no subduction to one that has modern plate subduction um, is still hotly debated. And I won't say that this the, the stuff that I'm going to be presenting today is an answer to this question, but it provides a little bit of a clue or some more insight um, into this into this uh, concept. So um, here I'm showing a figure from um, a paper by June Kornaga, which shows um, the geologic time scale. And it starts in the Hadean all the way up to the Phanerozoic. And here um, I'm showing different estimates from different studies about the timing, the onset time of plate tectonics. And you can see that these um, timing estimates range anywhere from 0.85 billion years ago to more than 4.2 billion years ago. So this is a huge range of timing estimates that spans you know, more than two thirds of Earth's history. Um, and this is a, a wide, a really wide range of time. And the questions of you know, when plate tectonics started has a lot to do with um, uh, problems or issues with, with addressing this question in the first place. So when we think about how we know modern plate tectonics is actually happening, we can see physical um, manifestations of plate tectonics and plate subduction features, right? And so when we're going deeper in time, we don't really have that preservation um, because the whole formation of continental crust and the subsequent subduction of it um, through this conveyor belt is actually destroying our records of, um, of uh, rock, rock, rock formation and rock processes, right? And so a lot of what we know about um, plate tectonics and when subduction initiated are through looking at um, remnants of the rock record. So looking at detrital zircon age spectra, measuring trace elements and using isotope geochemistry as another tool to gain some insight, um, records of atmosphere, crust and mantle exchange, um, and then model-based estimates. So actually trying to model um, uh, plate activity in deep time, right? So um, I don't think I really need to explain why we care about when plate subduction began, but um, here I'm showing kind of a schematic of what happens when we have plate subduction. So plate subduction is uh, really important because it's really facilitating the exchange of um, wet hydrated crust and sediments from um, and also seawater from the surface, from Earth's surface to the deep interior, right? And so when this is returned to the Earth's surface through volcanism, it's returning carbonates um, through volcanism, it's expelling CO2, right? And so on long time scales, uh, the rock cycle is a, a really big control on the global carbon cycle, right? It's one of the primary controls. And um, thinking about what happens to this, um, to these sediments into the rock that uh, is exposed on Earth's surface over time, we know that silicate weathering not only provides this biologically limiting nutrients to the Earth's surface, but it also uh, influences the global carbon cycle through its consumption of CO2. So it's kind of this huge influence on glo the global carbon cycle and, and Earth's habitability through time, right? And if you look kind of closely in this figure, I have some um, isotopes, some non-traditional stable isotopes that um, have been used in um, you know, continental crust uh, studies recently to try to disentangle or tease apart the different processes uh, that occurred during continental crust formation and how um, these physical mechanisms are actually affecting the isotope compositions themselves. Um, and so uh, you can see here that titanium is listed here and titanium has, um, has been a really useful tool um, in the past several years or so. Um, so titanium is really the tool that we're using. Um, it has five stable isotopes um, ranging from titanium 46 to titanium 50. It's a high field strength element. Um, so it has a low solubility, it's refractory and it's a lithophile. So it likes to be in rocks. Uh, on Earth's surface, it's present um, as titanium four plus. So 
it's relatively, it should be unaffected by fluctuating redox conditions, um, both in the atmosphere and in the oceans. And um, we're measuring titanium in per mil notation. So this is basically the ratio of titanium 49 over 47 um, with respect to a standard. And the origins lab standard is actually a titanium rod that has been dissolved. Um, and so any deviation from the standard will be in positive or negative numbers. Right, and I'm showing the abundances, um, and this question has come up before, but we're measuring 47, which has an abundance of about 7%, and 49, which has an abundance of about 5%. So um, this paper by Marc Albanier was one of the first ones that was published um, about titanium isotope variations in terrestrial um, materials. And um, I'm showing um, this figure on the right-hand side, and it may be hard to read, but Basically, we have titanium isotope composition on the x-axis, um, and we have different types of rocks, um, uh, terrestrial basalts, uh, mantle-derived samples, uh, eclogites, and uh, lunar basalts um, uh, shown on this plot. Right? And so I think one of the first things that happens when a new uh, isotope system is developed is uh, you know, people start to ask these questions of how useful can this isotope system be in um, understanding our evolution of the solar system. Can it give us new insight into the earth um, moon formation? How does it behave during magmatic differentiation? You know, um, is there a difference between the mantle versus primitive uh, terrestrial basalts versus evolved continental crust? Um, can it serve as a proxy for crust and mantle interactions? And then finally, people start to ask these questions about what is its behavior on Earth's surface? Um, does it fractionate during low temperature processes? Um, can it be important for understanding um, uh, the, the cycling of this element on Earth's surface through time? Um, the main takeaway from this, um, from this uh, figure is that the titanium isotope signature of the Earth and Moon were found to be almost identical, right? And so, um, uh, but taking a little deeper look into, the, into some of the samples that they measured here, they found something really interesting, actually. So I'm showing here um, titanium isotope composition with respect to silica content in um, some terrestrial uh, samples, right? And uh, the thing that they found that was really interesting is that you tend to have this heavy, so more positive titanium isotope enrichment with increasing silica content, such that the most evolved samples, things like rhyolites or granites, would have these heavier titanium isotope compositions and these primitive uh, mantle-like uh, basalts have these compositions that are close to zero per mil. It was hypothesized that this fractionation that occurs is due to the onset of, type of iron and titanium oxide crystallization. So basically, once these minerals, these titanium-bearing minerals, start to crystallize out of the melt, they um, incorporate, they preferentially incorporate the light isotopes of titanium, leaving behind a residually heavier and heavier melt. Uh, it was thought that this is due to a change in the coordination environment. So titanium coordination in a magma or in a melt is primarily fivefold, um, but we know that in iron and titanium oxides, it's primarily sixfold. Um, and based on our understanding of stable isotope theory, we know that heavier isotopes prefer to be in the lower coordination or the stronger bonding environment Right? And so this suggests that the onset of this crystallization um, will leave the melt residually heavier and heavier. So this relationship between um, silica content and titanium isotope composition um, uh, was kind of utilized in another study published by Nick Greber in 2017. Um, and so the idea here was that they would use titanium isotopes in, um, in shale samples going back 3.5 billion years to kind of reconstruct how uh, the silica content of um, Earth's continental crust through time, right? And they're using this relationship, this kind of um, monotonically increasing titanium isotope composition that was observed in, uh, in um, 
kind of magmatic samples, right? Um, uh, such that you know your most evolved samples have these heavier titanium isotope compositions, and your primitive samples have compositions close to zero. And the advantages, you know, thinking about the advantages of using titanium isotopes is that it should be unaffected by partial melting. We know that titanium isotope compositions increase with higher silica content. Um, and the idea here was that it could be potentially used for reconstructing the composition of the continental crust um, by examining the shale record. And so the use of shales is that, you know, the idea here is that the shale, you know, shale records are really the sedimentary archive of what has been weathered off of the continents, right? And so um, if you're examining the titanium isotope composition of a shale, this should be giving you sort of this average of what has been weathered off of the continent and transported um, into the oceans and preserved. Um, and so here I'm showing some um, igneous rock samples that uh, Nick Greber and Mark Alban measured um, on the left hand side and it's showing this well documented trend with titanium isotope composition and silica content. And then on the right hand side I'm showing the results of the shale study. And there's two different sections here. We have this green bar on the bottom, which is mafic and ultramafic rocks. And then this um, pink bar is showing felsic rocks. So we know that these felsic granitic rocks would be heavier in titanium isotope composition. And the shale data is shown um, as these blue circles here. And you can see that uh, the size of the data points corresponds to the number of samples that were measured. Um, but the main sort of takeaway from looking at the shale data is it doesn't seem like there was this secular change in titanium isotope composition um, with respect to time, right? So there's no dramatic increase um, you know, that occurred during um, a particular time period. Um, one could argue that maybe there's a bowing happening here. Um, but there's also uh, lighter isotope compositions that were observed. And so the main takeaway of this, of this study was that um, because the titanium isotope composition of the shale record hasn't significantly changed over three and a half billion years, that plate subduction must have initiated sometime prior to this, right? And because we have this consistently heavier titanium isotope composition, um, uh, somewhere in, in between mafic and ultramafic rocks and felsic rocks. So the interpretation of, of that study was really um, complicated when this paper was published um, in 2019. And this paper kind of expanded the suite of, of uh, rock types that were measured um, uh, looking at titanium isotope compositions, right? So before people had primarily been measuring rocks formed in arc settings and island arc settings and um, subduction settings. Uh, but uh, Deng et al. started to measure uh, rocks that had been formed in plume settings. So they looked at rocks from Iceland uh, and the Afar hotspot. And I'm showing um, on, the, on this plot here, basically the difference in behavior of titanium, uh, just concentration um, during magmatic differentiation between rocks formed in island arc settings versus rocks that are formed in plume settings. And the main difference, and it's kind of simplified in this smaller subplot here, is that uh, you know, rocks formed in plume settings tend to have this uh, higher titanium concentration, um, and there's a, a lack of titanium bearing oxides crystallizing until you reach this critical point where you're um, completely saturated in titanium. And after you reach this point, you start to crystallize your titanium and iron bearing oxides, resulting in this rapid uh, depletion in the titanium concentration. Um, and you can see this happening in real samples um, shown here on this larger plot, right? And so because there's a difference in the behavior of titanium, um, the concentration between these two rock types, it suggests that there is probably a difference in the behavior of the isotope composition. And that's exactly what they found. Um, and so here I'm showing one of the plots from that, from that study and it's basically showing that, you know, rocks formed in island arc settings are, are really um, characterized by these uh, lower titanium isotope compositions that then increase as they reach um, more evolved compositions. Whereas rocks that were formed in plume settings um, have a more dramatic fractionation of titanium isotope composition. Um, the, the main thing to kind of take away from this, um, from the study was in the reason why it 
drew the, the Greber paper into, into question a bit is that when you're looking at titanium isotope composition for rocks that are formed in plume settings versus rocks that are formed in island arc settings, uh, you can have the same titanium isotope composition, um, uh, uh, but have very different um, inferred silica contents. And so this was, was a bit of an issue. Um, but when we when we saw the data, um, it was it was a little interesting to us because um, and even the authors hinted at this um, in in their paper that perhaps uh, you know titanium isotopes could be used as a tool to infer the uh, the setting that the rock had formed in, whether or not it was formed in a plume or a dry environment versus an island arc uh, environment um, characterized by high high oxygen fugacity and water content. And so I'm briefly going to explain the difference between tholeitic and calcalkaline magmas. Um, and tholeitic uh, magmas can form in all different types of tectonic settings. <clears throat> so you can have them forming in plume environments, but you can also have them forming in um, subduction environments, right? Um, they're really characterized by um, being dry magmas. Calcalkaline magmas um, are, are typically unique to convergent margin settings. There are some cases where you find calcalkaline magmas that are not in convergent margin settings, but um, they're by far characterized by more convergent margin settings. So this, this convergent margin or an arc uh, um, margin, it, this arc magmatism is really a key process in the, in the formation of continental crust, right? And so we thought to ourselves that it could be interesting to measure some really ancient rocks that have really been through the ringer in terms of um, metamorphism to see whether or not we can kind of disentangle the process that these rocks had formed in. Um, but first we had some important questions about what's really driving the titanium isotope behavior. Um, and so I'm gonna briefly talk about a study that was published by Alicia Johnson, um, uh, when she came to um, University of Chicago to measure these samples. So she had this really great idea to look at samples from the Kilauea-Iki Lava Lake. Um, and the Kilauea-Iki Lava Lake is basically this crater in Hawaii um, that uh, filled up with magma and slowly crystallized through time, right? And I'm showing a cross section of it down here. And it's really a, a nice natural experiment for um, probing the fractional crystallization controls on isotope compositions. So how does iron or titanium isotope composition um, vary during uh, various stages of fractional crystallization? So Alicia's idea was to take samples from this very well-characterized environment and separate, separate the oxides and the non-oxide samples um, to test whether or not it's actually the crystallization of the titanium bearing oxides that's driving this titanium fractionation that we're seeing during magmatic differentiation. And so she used heavy liquid separation to um, kind of tease apart the different minerals that are present in the samples. And so showing a picture here of the high density minerals, and these are primarily um, the iron and titanium oxides that are within the rock samples. And then on the right hand side, we have our low density minerals, which would represent our, our residual melt. Um, a bit about the sample processing and chemistry. So titanium is very hard to dissolve, very hard to get into solution. So we have to use a furnace and flux fusion to actually get it to um, a glass bead form. So uh, we get it into this glass bead form and then we crush it and we're able to dissolve it and then uh, use column chemistry to separate uh, the titanium um, so that we can measure it uh, using the multi-collector uh, ICPMS. And I'm showing a picture of the MC ICPMS um, at the University of Chicago. So back to some of the data, uh, what Alicia found was that, um, you know, uh, our bulk samples from the Kilauea-Iki Lava Lake are relatively close to zero per mil, but then once you start to crystallize your iron and titanium bearing oxides, you see this jump in the, um, in the isotope composition. And so uh, our high density separates, so our oxide fraction were characterized by having light titanium isotopes, which is exactly what we would expect, and our residual melt um, was consistently heavier. And so this kind of confirms the fact that 
it's really the, the oxide crystallization that's driving the titanium isotope fractionation. Since then, um, there's been a lot of papers that have been published about titanium in the past um, two or three years. And so I'm showing a figure um, from a paper published by Liam Bohr in um, 2020, and he expanded the uh, amount or the types of samples that have been measured for titanium isotope compositions. So he basically took rocks that were formed in intraplate settings, uh, rocks that had been formed in mid-ocean ridge settings, and rocks that had been formed in um, subduction zone settings. And um, they're kind of color coded as red, black, uh, green, and, and blue. And what he found was that there's these contrasting patterns of titanium isotope fractionation between these different types of settings. Uh, he also found that alkaline sweets from intraplate settings display the most substantial variation, uh, followed by tholeites and calc alkaline sweets. And uh, the magnitude of this fractionation is primarily controlled by the composition, so the type of iron and titanium bearing oxides, and also the abundance. He also confirmed that the arc suites, um, they show these titanium isotope composition pathways um, that tend to scale with redox state and water content of the parental magmas. Um, so this is really interesting. We're starting to kind of um, key in a bit on the controls for titanium isotope fractionation. And it seems that oxygen fugacity or redox state and the water content is really the driving, the driving force. So um, to kind of summarize what titanium isotopes can tell us, uh, it's clear that uh, this is a figure that's adapted from um, a review article by Kathy Cashman, um, but it's clear that the light titanium isotopes are preferentially incorporated uh, into iron and titanium bearing oxides from the melt, leaving the residual melt um, uh, progressively heavier and heavier. We know that intraplate tholeites fractionate titanium more dramatically than those formed in arc settings. There are different titanium isotope pathways um, during differentiation processes, and they seem to be related to the redox state and the water content of the parental magmas. Uh, and so there's this really um, interesting potential for titanium isotopes to be used as a proxy for the geodynamic setting of magma generation. So now I'm gonna kind of transition into the samples that we measured here. So um, Jesse Raymink did a lot, all of his PhD work on the Acasta Nice complex um, located in the Slave Creton uh, in, in Canada. Um, and I'm kind of circling this region here. Um, and the Itawan Nice, um, uh, it translates to ancient times uh, in the Tlicho language. Um, but this, this Nice is um, dated at over 4.02 billion years old. And right now it's really our oldest known uh, intact crustal fragment on, on Earth's surface. Uh, Jesse's previous work, he did a lot of careful um, um, uh, trace element and um, um, petrology kind of characterization of these samples. And he came to the conclusion that these oldest samples that the Itawan Nice formed in an intraplate plume setting. Um, and the setting may have been very similar to what Iceland is like. So a shallow level fractional crystallization of uh, low uh, oxygen content, low water content, basaltic magma. Uh, I wanted to show some of the photos that Jesse shared with me from the field because I think they're really beautiful. Um, it's a little bit of a difficult place to get to. I actually wish I could have gone to do the field work because it looks really lovely. Um, but they flew in and um, this is kind of a boreal forest type environment. Um, <clears throat> Here's a picture of uh, some surface exposure with um, some forest in the background. And then here's another kind of close-up picture of some of the rock, um, rock sampling that Jesse did in the field, right? And so the Acasta Nice complex, um, there's been a lot of work that's been done um, uh, uh, throughout you know, the past like 20, 30 years or so. Uh, and what we know about it is that it has a really kind of complex polymetamorphic history. So it's been metamorphosed uh, many times. Um, the oldest units are identified at uh, 4.03 to 4.02 billion years old, and that there were subsequent periods of magmatic activity that occurred um, after that. 
There are zircons in these rocks um, and they're zoned. And so they have multiple ages um, and overgrowth and inclusions. Um, and I kind of wanted to show one of the figures from um, Jesse's previous work on the Acasta Nice complex, where he really looked at um, the behavior of the uh, Itawa Nice, so the really ancient um, tonalitic Nice, um, in, with respect to this uh, uh, this diagram. You know, the behavior between calc alkaline versus um, rocks that are characterized by this um, iron enrichment rocks that we think you know uh, are characterized by. Uh, forming in a plume environment, right? And so um, they're characterized by this iron enrichment. Um, when you look at the rare earth element uh, concentrations, these ancient rocks are also characterized by these negative europium anomalies. Um, they have relatively unfractionated rare earth element patterns. Uh, they have zircons that have low oxygen isotope ratios. Um, so these, these geochemical characteristics are um, not typical Archean igneous rocks, but are uh, very similar to rocks that, uh, silicic rocks from Iceland. And um, so he came to the conclusion that these rocks must have formed by some shallow level magmatic process um, that may have included the assimilation of rocks that had interacted with uh, surface waters. So I kind of wanted to start showing some of my data uh, and so here, you know, I've done some melts, some simple melts modeling to um, show the behavior, the difference in behavior um, of uh, titanium concentration between um, calc alkaline rocks. So a typical calc alkaline rock composition, and I modeled it through magmatic differentiation. And I also did the same for a typical foliatic um, uh, composition, right? And we see this characteristic uh, kind of rapid increase in titanium concentration before the uh, uh, subsequent kind of um, saturation and crystallization that occurs. On the right-hand side, I'm showing a compilation of literature data that we have for titanium isotope compositions relative to silica content. And there's quite a bit now. Um, but the main thing that I wanted to point out is that I've color-coded them based on the settings that they, um, that they come from. So these blue samples on the bottom are modern calc alkaline rocks. The red samples on the top are modern interplate foliatic rocks. Uh, I've also included in here some modern mid-ocean ridge foliatic rocks in gray. And then I also have some A-type rhyolites and granites. When, when we plot our um, samples from the Itawa and Acasta Nice complex. So we're looking at these really old rocks that are 4.02 billion years old, but we're also looking at younger rocks that range in age from about 3.94 billion years old to about 3.6 billion years old. And they're, um, they have different symbols based on their age. Uh, the oldest rocks are the gray circles and the younger rocks are um, regular triangles, inverted triangles, and squares. And when we're looking at the left-hand plot, there doesn't seem to be a significant difference in the behavior of titanium concentration between these samples. Um, a lot of them are beyond this point where we would expect to see this typical uh, enrichment of titanium concentration before the depletion and crystallization. Um, but the interesting thing that we see happens with the um, titanium isotope composition of the samples. So if you look at the right-hand side of the, of the slide, um, I'm basically plotting our ancient rock samples on top of our modern analogs. And um, you can see that there's a difference in the behavior between the 4.02 billion year old Itawa Nice um, compared to the modern um, or not modern, sorry, compared to the younger um, Acasta Nice. So anything that's really, you know, younger than 3.94 billion years old is kind of um, characterized by uh, this uh, lying on this modern calc alkaline array, whereas our older rocks um, are characterized by uh, falling on this uh, modern interplate foliatic array. Um, and so we see this difference in the behavior and we, uh, our first kind of interpretation of the data was that there seems to be a difference in the, in the magmatic setting that may have formed um, these rock types. But 
we decided to dig a little bit deeper and see if we can kind of disentangle the trends a little bit more. And so um, here I'm showing um, an index that we developed um, and it's, in the, it's it, in the manuscript and you may be wondering like, why should we be developing a new index for classifying igneous rocks? Um, and the hope here was to try to be very sure that the rocks, the titanium isotope compositions of these rock samples are actually telling us something about the, um, about the setting that the rock may have formed in. Right, and so um, here I'm showing the relationship between uh, the, the log of the silica content divided by the titanium content with respect to titanium isotope composition on the on the y axis. Um, and you can see that our modern calc alkaline samples are really characterized by a lower uh, a, a lower slope um, with respect to our modern tholeitic um, uh, rocks. Right, and so it's clear that these two magmatic series are defining two distinct linear trends, which can be fitted with a line, so they can be um, parameterized. Right, and these these linear correlations they can they converge at this point, and so you can kind of create this um, this uh, equation to kind of um, characterize these these rock types, and so we call this equation the Timmy which is the titanium isotope magmatic index. And it's really the relationship of the titanium isotope composition of the rock, um, plus uh, you know, where it intercepts, right? And then um, divided over the relationship of the logarithm of the uh, ratio between silica and titanium. And so um, why is this helpful? Well, it allows us to parameterize our samples a little bit more. Uh, we can actually classify one individual rock rather than a series of rocks. Um, uh, it works for very evolved rocks, so rocks that are high in silica content. And the idea here is that um, because we're measuring titanium, which is um, a high field strength element and relatively resistant to um, dissolution, it should be robust against weathering. And so this parameterization kind of indicates that a Timmy of about 0.6 um, is really something that is uh, on a calc alkaline trend, whereas a Timmy characterized by greater than one is on this kind of tholeitic trend. And so the, the idea here is that the steeper the slope, so the higher the Timmy, the more iron and titanium oxides uh, that crystallize at low silica content, um, which is characteristic of, of tholeitic differentiation. So we did that with our modern samples, um, right? And we plotted them here. And these, these, again, the colored symbols are indicating our modern analogs. So red are modern interplate foliatic and blue are modern calc alkaline rocks. And these colored um, arrows here are actually the MELTS model data that um, we produced. And the model data um, agrees really well with our modern samples. So we were, we were happy about that, right? And so, um, here I'm showing the relationship of the uh, log SiO2 over TiO2 with respect to titanium. And then over on the right-hand side, I'm showing the log SiO2 over TiO2 with respect to Timmy. And so uh, our, our uh, average sort of modern calc alkaline rocks is shown as this blue dashed line here. And our average tholeitic uh, Timmy trend is shown as this red dashed line here. And so when we plot our, our rock samples from the Itawa and Acasta Nice on top of it, um, it's clear to me that the two samples or the two different time periods are characterized by different Timmy trends. So the, the 4.02 um, billion year old Itawa and Nice are characterized by higher Timmy values, whereas all of our samples that are really younger than 3.75 uh, billion years old are really characterized by these lower um, Timmy values. And so we kind of think that this is, we think that this is evidence of the fact that, you know, these rock types, they formed in different or distinct magmatic settings. Um, and, uh, you know, you can kind of create this plot of, of your Timmy, your titanium isotope magmatic index with respect to age um, uh, shown here, right? And so if we plot our Hadean Itawa Nice up here, it looks very similar to our tholeitic Timmy average, 
And then as we move towards our younger samples, our Archean Acastanice samples, they're more characterized by this modern calc alkaline to me average, right? And then if we move into other samples that have been measured by um, Nick Greber, looking at um, uh, TTGs, these are also um, uh, close to the um, modern kind of calc alkaline to me average as well. So our titanium isotope data, um, they really seem to indicate the presence of calc alkaline magmatism um, around 3.75 billion years ago, which supports the transport of um, relatively hydrated, so wet crust to great depths. Um, and this is a this is a takeaway or a, a um, kind of an inference that um, Jesse Raymond has also come to um, with some of his data, some of his um, publications that have been um, made on these samples, right? And so our our main takeaways from this from this study is that you know because we're seeing the um, the the isotope kind of signature of this wet magmatism, it is indicative of the fact that we have subduction-like tectonic behavior that could have initiated, at least on a local scale, uh, relatively early in Earth's history, right? And so um, one thing that I wanna kind of reiterate is that because we're seeing this, this trend or this um, kind of uh, record at this one particular location, the exposure of the acastanice itself is relatively small. And because we're seeing it in one location, I'm not making a broad sweeping claim that this is happening um, everywhere throughout this particular time period in Earth's history. Um, but we seem to kind of clue in a little bit more in the difference in the magmatic behavior um, at this site between about 4.02 and 3.75 billion years ago. Um, the rock record still doesn't provide evidence of the magnitude or the extent of this continental crust um, right, And this is kind of a byproduct of the fact that it's really difficult for us to obtain rock samples to make these measurements. Um, but I do think that uh, it's kind of promising for, for future um, analysis of rocks that kind of span the same or similar time period. So there's still a lot of work that um, remains to be done with titanium isotopes. Um, you know, there's questions, I think about a year or two ago, we were asking ourselves whether or not titanium isotopes can tell us more about initial uh, meltwater content or oxygen fugacity um, in magma. And it seems like, so what's been published over the past um, year or two uh, that Titanium seems to be a very good indicator of redox state and um, water content. And so, you know, um, I'm showing this figure from the paper published by Liam Hoare, which basically shows the relationship between water content, so decreasing water content and titanium isotope composition here. So there is definitely a difference in the behavior of titanium isotopes um, with respect to water content um, uh, during magmatic differentiation. And this paper was recently published um, in the past month or so, you know, where they have this kind of experimental petrology approach to looking at the, um, the redox dependence of titanium isotope fractionation in, um, in synthetic titanium rich lunar melts. So demonstrating that um, the redox state really matters a lot um, in terms of um, dictating how titanium isotopes will fractionate um, during, fract during differentiation processes. So I think that more measurements of rocks from um, well-characterized magmatic settings is what um, is really needed. Um, and uh, measuring titanium isotope compositions in rocks that span this time period um, could provide some more insight into whether the timing of this process was just something that we're observing locally, something that we're seeing at the Acastanice versus something that um, could have been more of a global phenomenon. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the future work um, that will be coming out in the next several years or so on this topic. Uh, and so with that, I, I'd like to thank everyone for staying through the talk and um, like to take any questions if there are any. Great, thank you, uh, Sarah. That was really good. Um, and yeah, I think we should open the floor for any questions or discussion. Um, it seems this week uh, that people are still getting used to 
uh, either getting used to daylight savings time or I realized that some internationals might start joining actually in in about 13 minutes. Um, so uh, we'll see if that if that happens. Um, but I, I don't think we have any, we'll have any troubles if people just want to unmute themselves um, and ask and ask a question. So um, it looks to me that uh, like Dr. Kent Condi already is ready. So go right ahead. Sarah, that was very exciting results, I think. And I have one question about A-type granites. You, meant, you, you showed a slide that had those on there um, and, and they sort of fall in two fields. Uh, Ebby suggested there was an A2 type and an A1 type. They had very different tectonic settings. I was wondering if you had information on titanium isotopes in the two types of A-type granites. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um, I actually had a slide uh, about that. I'm just trying to find it right now. Um, okay. Um, So I, I didn't include this, but um, this figure is in the supplement of uh, the paper that was recently published. And it's basically, um, it's showing the, the modern sort of trend that we see with our modern tholeitic rocks. So these kind of like um, grayed out red circles and then our modern calgalkaline rocks. And then on top of it, I have plotted our A-type granites as these inverted open red um, triangles, and then our modern, our, our I-type and S-type granites are plotted down here. Um, I don't have information about the different classifications of the A-type granites. Um, uh, it would be interesting to look into that a bit more, um, but, you know, I, I put in here, you know, some, some proposed mechanisms for how A-type granites are formed. Um, and, you know, one of the theories is, is, or one of the ideas is that it, they're the result of a, the differentiation of um, anhydrous or dry magmas. Um, and based on where they lie on the, um, on the titanium isotope versus the silica content versus TiO2 content trend, um, it appears that they look very similar to modern uh, tholeitic rocks. Um, yeah, those two A-type granites you have there are probably A2 types, uh, I think, uh, do you know? Um, I have to check and get back to you. I can get back to you on that. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah, because like I said, A2 types probably form in convergent margin settings, but A1 types are within plate sort of settings and um, so they're quite different from each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think there's still a lot that we, a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of characterizing rocks that have been formed in, in modern settings and like what we know about them. Um, so it would be really interesting to kind of dig into that a little bit more. So I think what's been done so far is really kind of just a, um, like a, sampling right and so digging into into uh more samples and and trying to disentangle the um the controls on titanium isotope fractionation or what we can use titanium isotopes to tell us about rock formation would be really interesting um thank you thank you Anybody else have any questions for, uh, for Sarah? Um, now, I have a question that is just um, it's, it's more just a question about um, how we measure titanium isotopes and why, um, but, and, and I just don't know. Um, so why, when you're measuring, ti reporting titanium isotopes and measuring them, why, um, uh, 
why why the two it's 59 and 57 rather than 59 and 58 or um it's uh it's 40 49 49 47 yeah and um yeah i mean we measured those two uh ratios uh because their abundances are relatively similar to one another um and i can't i mean people measure um uh i guess anomalies in in like extraterrestrial samples um so they look at uh i think uh titanium 50 anomalies um and so i mean we measure titanium 49 and 47 we measure all of them all of the isotopes um but we only report 49 to 47 um and yeah so hopefully that answers that question um, uh, I'm, I'm taking Andre's isotope geochemistry class right now, and I know sometimes we just try to focus on using ones that are the most uh, abundant, so I was just wondering why not 58, um, but no, that does help. Thank you. Um, it looks like Jean Bedard had a question here. Do different uh, titanium minerals have the same effect, titanium versus uh, titanite versus ilmenite versus rutile, or even titanium magnetite? Yeah, that's a really good question, too. Um, the answer is um, oh, we think so. So there's been a few papers, like I think one or maybe two papers, and I'm also working on one right now, um, that use um, like ab initio calculations of um, force constants for different titanium bearing minerals to try to predict um, whether or not it's the different mineral types that's affecting the trajectory of the, of the titanium isotope um, composition of, of magma during evolution. And um, what we're finding is that there is a dependence, um, um, you know, different, most of the, most of the titanium bearing minerals are in six fold coordination, um, but there are small differences in the force constants that can drive differences in the isotope fractionation between the melt and the crystallizing mineral. Um, and so I suspect that um, there, there is like a difference in the, in the, um, the mineral type that's also really strongly driving the, the fractionation that we're seeing. Um, yeah, and so I think one way to do it is using like the ab initio approach where you're looking at these, um, what, what is predicted by like the theory. And then the other thing would be to actually look at um, real, real mineral separates and, and try to do the measurements too. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, Sarah, uh, so you showed the data for barbering, which, which seems to agree also with what you observed in Acosta. And for what time you can go to multiple places and work on TTGs like from India or from Western Australia or Brazil. Do you think uh, with this approach you can establish if it's local versus global um, sort of subduction and plate tectonics at that time? Uh, I think that if you had a, a suite of data from all over that covered a particular time period, you could probably make a more um, kind of generalized statement about what could have been happening, right? But there's also I think it's important to be careful about interpretations, um, you know, thinking about preservation bias is something that's really important. So um, whether or not the rocks that we do see or that we are finding and that we are, we are measuring are representative of what was actually happening is important too. Um, but yeah, I do think that it would be helpful to measure more rocks that kind of spanned this time period for sure. Sure. Yeah, well, yeah, I, and I also, I don't want to like say too much, but there there are some, we've had a follow-up study um, measuring another, a suite of other rocks from this time period, and it seems to be in agreement with what we found here. So that was really exciting um, for me too, so. 
Uh, Alex, I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, sir, is it possible or have you tried to distinguish um, rocks on the foliatic fractionation trend in arc systems from the foliatic fractionation trend in non-arc and within point? Yeah, that's a good question. And no, we haven't yet. And that should still be done. So I'm curious to see whether or not there is a difference. Um, and I think- That could be very important in a constraining tectonic setting. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I need to get my hands on some foliatic rocks that were formed in an arc setting uh, to, to kind of see what the data looks like. Um, but the, yeah, that's a really important thing to do for sure. Yeah, go right ahead, Paul. Yeah, just a historical uh, note. The castanizes were not dated in an attempt to find old rocks. Uh, it was a test of a model we had for Watme origin at a time when we thought uh, that margin was very short lived, not the 134 million years we now believe. And uh, anyway, we uh, dated it or Sam Bowering dated it uh, to see whether it might be 2 billion years old rather than Archean. And I believe the first mineral that he dated was a Titanite, uh, which gave an age of 3.6. And uh, <laughs> then the hunt for old rocks was on. Okay, yeah, thanks for that information. I didn't know about that, but yeah, that, yeah, that must have been really exciting uh, when that, when you got that data for sure. Yeah, and I, I tried to talk a little bit about it, I, uh, about the previous work that's been done, but yeah, I mean, these rocks are, there's been a lot of work uh, over the past, uh, yeah, um, I guess recent history that's been done on these rocks. So I felt I felt very lucky to get my hands on on these samples to be able to measure them, and I felt yeah very grateful for the for the work that had been done to place these rocks into more of a geologic context. I'll sure. send you an image of uh, Sam Bowering, the discoverer on on the Acasta outcrop. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think some uh, of the international attendees. Yeah, I was just about to say, I think my suspicion was right um, that the other half of your audience is joining now. Um, Fortunately, it's recorded, so they don't have access to it. Yeah. So for those of you who are joining now, I think I, I owe an apology for not bringing attention to this in over email and not anticipating, but uh, uh, here in the States, we have observed um, a time change due to um, uh, a change in daylight savings time that moves us an hour earlier. And I didn't bring that up in the um, in, our, in my emails that went out. So to all of you that just joined hoping to watch a talk, it just just happened now. And I will certainly be posting it on, on, um, on our YouTube channel so that you all can can watch it after the fact. Again, apologies for that. Um, but for now, would anybody else like to uh, ask a question or discuss anything about uh, Sarah's talk? I just might mention that the uh, what the photos of the area don't show are the mosquitoes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, I I didn't have any mosquito pictures, but being from Alaska, I'm very familiar with mosquitoes uh, in the tundra environment. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a little jealous of the field work itself because it looks super beautiful, but uh, yeah, I'm not jealous of the mosquitoes either. So. Yeah, Sam Bowering had a long history of working in the area right at the tree line where the flies are absolutely the worst. And so this was a guy with a very uh, high threshold of discomfort. Yeah, definitely. Was it just mosquitoes? Was it also gnats and, and horse flies? Mosquitoes and black flies. Okay. 
Yeah. Cause right at the uh, tree line, um, you, uh, you have low bushes. And so when the wind blows, the flies just go down in the bushes and wait for you. Yeah. Yes, when I was there with Sam, the black flies drove me out. In two days, I had to take the plane out of there because I was so swollen, I, I could hardly walk. I had a question. Go ahead, John. Um, a lot of the tholeitic suites you showed, the intraplate tholeites, they're actually kind of unusual even today. It's Hawaii, it's, uh, I thought, you I think you showed a far, and all of these are borderline alkaline, leading to very high titanium contents. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed in your simulation, you were getting up to three, 4% titanium. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, those are kind of unusual rocks to start with now. Mm -hmm. And from reading the uh, that really good paper you referred to uh, on the Acasta Nice by Reinick, I hope I got the, the name right, I had the impression that the melts he was proposing were involved were kind of unusual too, unusually rich in iron and titanium. Mm -hmm. So to what extent is the Acasta Nice representative of, of that period anyway? I mean, it might be an exceptional thing. Uh, so yeah, you mean like, can we really be using modern tholeites as a as representative representative of <clears throat> what we would be expecting in the Itawa Nice? Well, maybe, but I, I noticed your Morb suites were much more similar to your calc alkaline suites in most respects, but transitional in other respects. So, uh, and and you didn't discuss AFC processes either. If you're reworking older felsic rock, and if you melt at the base of the, of the crust and you're leaving out residual titanium minerals, how can you distinguish that from fractional crystallization extraction of titanium minerals? Yeah, so, you know, talking about partial melting versus fractional crystallization. Yeah, process is, is, is probably what you're seeing, I think, rather than tectonic environment. Yeah, I mean, we did some um, we did some modeling in the paper, um, trying to disentangle like how um, partial melting versus fractional crystallization I would. Read this. <laughs> huh? I must read this. Yeah, so it's the paper came out in December. It's in Science Advances, um, and uh, yeah, so we did some modeling, basically looking at how partial melting versus fractional crystallization drives titanium evolution. Um, and what we find is that you can get some titanium fractionation from partial melting, but it's not the same magnitude that you would be able to get with fractional crystallization. Um, so it's not a similar mag uh, magnitude that we observe in our, um, in our Itawan nice samples. I'm trying to find the figure from the paper itself. Um, yeah, and I agree that the, the intraplate tholeitic uh, rocks that we're showing, right, like Afar uh, and uh, Hecla, right, are not, are a little bit different, right? Um, I also showed some some data from the Kilauea Iki Lava Lake, um, yeah, and uh, and then also there's some samples from um, like Morbs, some Morb samples as well. Um, but what we're finding is that like uh, partial melting can't really reach us to these heavy titanium isotope compositions that we observe in the Itawa nice um, samples. And so we kind of, based on our modeling, ruled that out as a possibility. Um, yeah, I should have included that figure in the- Oh, that's the a, it's a new field, eh? it's always a can of worms. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, and that's, it's a really valid point to bring up in a, in a really good question is like whether or not, um, you know, because another, another theory about the, uh, the Itawan Nice is that they're the result of an impact um, melt, right? And so um, that was, that was the reason why we did the, uh, the partial melting calculation is to see whether or not if, you know, if you had an impact melt, could this drive your titanium isotope compositions of your rocks to heavy enough compositions so that what we're seeing isn't, you know, without a doubt, the result of um, fractional crystallization. Um, okay. 
I actually have the slide here. Um, okay. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, that's, this is kind of what we did. So we have like the mantle composition, like close to zero per mil. And then, um, we, uh, we used some of the trace element, um, data from a paper published by Johnson et al. And I think it was 2018 and it was kind of, um, attributing the Itawan nice formation to an impact, a melt, um, origin. And so that range of um, like titanium, uh, um, like content fractionation is what I'm showing here in, in red, right? And we basically modeled how the melts versus the residue would, uh, would evolve in a, in, a, um, in a partial melting scenario on the left-hand side, right? And then the, the span of titanium isotope compositions that the Itawan nice range from are shown as this gray box here. So like it's a it's around like 0 0.5 per mil, 0 0.54 per mil, all the way up to almost one per mil. Um, and then on the right hand side, I'm showing some of our models for fractional crystallization. Um, and for modeling the fractional crystallization, um, we're, we're using this fractionation factor between um, the melt and the cumulates um, that's been constrained by like two different studies. The first one, um, the first value is from Mark Alban's paper published in 2016. Um, and this is basically like something that he empirically derived based on like the titanium isotope fractionation that you see during magmatic differentiation. And then um, this larger one is from Alicia Johnson's paper where she actually had some um, mineral melt um, uh, compositions to kind of drive this fractionation factor. And so I'm, I'm showing here how the residual melt fractionates titanium isotopes um, during fractional crystallization. And like the main takeaway, I guess, for this figure is that you can reach much um, higher titanium or heavier titanium isotope compositions with a fractional crystallization scenario versus that in a partial melting scenario. It's funny, I look at that plot and I, I come to ex almost exactly the opposite conclusion. <laughs> uh, you look on the left and all of your partial melts are jacked up to 0.3. Whereas on the right, you have to fractionate a huge amount to get that much enrichment it, because you have to wait until the titanium mineral saturates. Whereas in the partial melting scenario, they're automatically saturated in the titanium mineral. So it's actually much more reproducible as a process, whereas fractionation will, will be all over the map. And I agree that uh, your, your Idiwa nice uh, doesn't fit the partial melting scenario at all. It's much more compatible with an extreme fractionation story. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we've taken these uh, mineral melt fractionation factors and plugged them into basically a fractional crystallization scenario. And um, I mean, I guess this will come out in a paper that will soon to be published, but you can reproduce pretty well what's observed in the modern based on these fractionation factors and the melts modeling itself. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, I just, I think the bottom line is like from what we know about um, about partial melting and our constraints that we have for that, it's it, it can't reach the magnitude that we can reach with a fractional crystallization scenario. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we're reaching values that are consistent with what we observe in the Itawa nice samples. Um, and so our main, I guess our main, our main takeaway from that is that the Itawan nice were, were Produced were likely produced through fractional crystallization and and not the impact melt um, induced partial melting. All right. Um, thanks, Sarah, and thanks everyone for a great discussion today. I myself have to run, so I'm going to end our 
our meeting for today. Um, but looking forward to seeing you all next week. I'll definitely post this video today. Um, so or I won't see you all next week. You'll be hanging out with Andre, but uh, um, I'll see everybody in two weeks. So take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah.